Hi everyone. In this video, what I would like to do is compute the area that lies between two concentric circles in the first quadrant two different ways. One, the kind of classic double integral way, and the other one as a surface integral. And I want to explain why I chose to do this two different ways at the end. So what we have here is the region between the circles of radius two and five in the first quadrant. Both of these integrals are going to use the same polar description for this region. So let me note here that our radius will be between two and five, and our angular component will be between zero and pi over two to keep us in the first quadrant. Okay, let's knock this out first as a double integral. So we can say the area of this region is going to be the double integral. Well, actually, first let me write down a general expression. It's the double integral over r of 1 dA. And when I write dA here, I'm really referring to your standard rectangular differentials. So this could be like dx dy or dy dx. Now to evaluate this, for the outer bounds, we can go from 0 to pi over 2. And then for the inner bounds, from 2 to 5, 1, and then because we're converting from rectangular into polar coordinates, I need to pick up a factor of r, then dr d theta. Okay, this is the interesting thing to get to is the setup, but let's go ahead and finish. Let's see if I anti-differentiate with respect to r, we get r squared over 2 going from 2 to 5. Still have to anti-differentiate with respect to theta. So let me pull this computation out and write 25 over 2 minus 4 over 2 times theta from 0 to pi over 2. So that's going to be pi over 2 minus 0. So overall, it's 21 pi over 4. Let's see if we can get to the same result, reimagining this as a surface integral computation. So what I mean by that is what I want to parametrize this region in R2 like a flat surface and then do a surface integral where the integrand will be 1. Okay, so what we need first is a parametric description of the surface. I will describe this as a surface in R3. That's how we usually see surface integrals, which means that my parametric description is going to be well, the radius varies from 2 to 5, so that's one parameter. And the angle varies, so that's my other parameter. Therefore, my x-coordinate is going to be u cosine v. My y-coordinate is u sine v. But then my z-coordinate is just going to be 0 because we're actually flat in the xy plane. Okay, so that's a parametric description for this region in R2, or in R2 now situated in R3. Let's do the vectors r, u, and r, v. That means take the partial derivative of each of these components with respect to u, and then with respect to v. So that's going to be cosine of v, sine of v, 0. And then for the second one, we will have negative u sine of v. That's a v. This is a u. Careful. And then u cosine of v and 0. Both of these vectors live flat in the plane. So when we take the cross product, it's going to point either straight up or straight down, as it should, because it should be perpendicular to the surface. So what is R u cross R v? Well, you can check this, but the first two components are going to be 0. So this vector either points straight up or straight down. For the, uh, the third component, we have u cosine squared minus negative u sine squared. So that's u cosine squared plus u sine squared. Overall, that is u. Since our radial component u goes from 2 to 5, I didn't write it down, but it's the same bounds for u and v as we have up here. This means that our orthogonal vector points straight up because this third component is going to be positive. We need the length of this for a surface scalar integral, scalar surface integral. So I'm going to take the magnitude of this cross product. As we just mentioned, u is positive. So overall, the magnitude of this is the absolute value of u, which is u. OK. 
Now the area of R, I'm doing like a surface area computation with a surface integral. Should get to the same result. What we're doing is integrating over a surface now, one ds, where this is the differential with respect to surface area. I'm just going to write down now the evaluation form, and what we'll realize is that it's the same as here, so we don't need to do the rest of it. Okay, what we do is we evaluate this integrand on the parametrization, but the integrand is a constant one. We then multiply that by the length of this cross product. That's going to multiply by u. Now we're going to integrate this across the parameters. So for v, that's 0 to pi over 2. For u, it's 2 to 5 and then du dv. And now we can stop because while the letters might be different, this is otherwise the same integral as here. So we just happen to know it's 21 pi over 4. Like that. What I want to illustrate here is that the u comes into this computation from this cross product's magnitude. That is the scaling factor that we picked up when we set this up as a double integral. The reason why I want to point this out is that when you do a surface area, or sorry, a surface integral computation, whether it's a scalar surface integral or a vector surface integral, flux integral, if you parametrize your surface using polar coordinates or cylindrical spherical coordinates, you do not manually bring in the change factor that you do bring in when you set up a double triple integral by converting dx dy to dr d theta. So when you describe your parametric surface using polar coordinates, the conversion factor is already built into the process. So this u here was given to us through our parametrization when we arrived on this line. So by parametrizing with polar coordinates, taking the cross product, taking the length, we absorbed into the computation what we would normally bring in manually as a change factor. So students in multivariable calculus often ask like, oh, I don't need to bring it in. And I'm like, no, don't, don't bring it in. It's not even correct to do so. It's in the computation already. You don't have to worry about it.